This is Leadership in Action, and I'm Mark Stiles, your host. Join me as we delve deep into the passions, expertise, and experiences of Boston area innovators. Sponsored by the Boston Chapter of Entrepreneurs Organization, this is Leadership in Action. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Leadership in Action. Today's guest is a financial mastermind. He is an expert at effectively balancing accounting needs, reporting priorities, operational requirements, and budget constraints. He loves helping small businesses become financially fit. He's the author of the book, The Financial Operating System. Founder and CEO at SmartBooks, please meet Calvin Wilder. What's up, Cal? Thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really looking forward to having a discussion with you today. Cool. I can't wait to learn some stuff because we had a pre-call and uh, I am open for learning right now. So let's get right to it. What is a common misconception about leadership, running a business, and being an entrepreneur? Well, one that I often see is the belief that you know bigger is always better, that being an entrepreneur is all about growth at any cost. And uh, for most of my career, that was my attitude as well, that you know, building something of value means growing a business as big as possible. But uh, you know, I've kind of learned over the years that's not always the case. That's interesting. So where, where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that belief originates that gro- that entrepreneurism means rocket ship growth? I mean, I think we just look around us and see all these examples of rocket ships and think that um, to be successful means scaling a business exponentially, um, because that's what we see businesses that have done that and survived and grown to become big companies. But um, if we look closely, like that's not the that's not the trajectory for most businesses. Uh, most businesses are not going to become the next Salesforce.com, but they can still be great businesses and great uh, great for their owners. That's really interesting. So there's the front page companies, but then there's page six promotional material, but then there's nowhere in any periodical, but an awesome business, quote unquote, scaled for growth, but not rocket ship growth. Tell me, tell me the differential and how, how we get there. Well, I think, um, you know, what I've seen looking at hundreds of, of small businesses over the years and working with them is that some businesses in some industries, when they try to force growth by investing a lot of money in marketing and sales, it ends up being like pushing on a string. You know, you can spend a lot of time and money and management focus, but unfortunately not have much to show for it. At the end of the day, you know, I've seen clients do it. I'm guilty of doing it myself. Um, One of the reasons I wrote the book, The Financial Operating System, was to help um, kind of small business owners clarify what they're really trying to achieve financially from their business and then have a process to measure and manage um, performance against their financial objectives. And those financial objectives could be a lot of different things, Um, could be working fewer hours per week in the business and maintaining an income, could be, you know, growing and scaling the next uh, dot com company, Um, you know, anything in between. That's that's cool. So you wrote this book to help others, to make sure that they maybe didn't make the same mistakes you might have made. Yeah, certainly that's part of it. Um, you know, I think a lot of I've just seen a lot of small business owners uh, just feel like they're just not in control over the financial performance of their business, and the business is pulling them in various directions that are not the directions that they want to be going in, um, but they don't know what to do about it. You know, they're not, they're stressed out. They're not making enough as much money as they want to be making, or they're working way too many hours per week, or they just have no idea how their business is really performing to, um, aside from whether they have cash in the bank to make payroll. And so um, it's a system that I used over decades to, to help small businesses. And I felt like if I could get this in a book, it would, help people, you know, do it themselves and understand it and not have to hire me necessarily. Cool. So your, so your system is the book. So tell us what the system is then the steps. So it's, yeah, it's a six step process, ultimately allowing the small business owner to take control over their financials and improve their financial fitness. Um, And the first step is to identify your why 
you know, why are you in business and what are you trying to achieve by owning your business? If we don't know why we're owning a business and running a business, then, you know, we, we can't really know how to manage it until we understand, you know, what's our actual objective. Um, so step one is to figure out why we're owning the business, what we're ultimately trying to accomplish with it. Then step two is to assess your current financial performance and compare it against what your objectives are, uh, at least at a, a top level. You know, is the business profitable or not? What has the growth rate been over the last few years? Basic metrics like that. Um, and then step three is to really dive in and define some goals and specific financial metrics um, to really assess how the business is performing on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual basis against the objectives of the ownership group or the owner of the ownership group, right? So we're going to know what we're aiming at. And so making sure those metrics and goals are aligned with the objectives of the owner is key. If the owner really cares about uh, profitability and saving money to be able to retire one day, then we want some metrics around profit margins, Um and maybe growth is less important. So we got to tailor the metrics to the objectives of the owner. And then inevitably, um, there's usually some upgrading that needs to be done to the bookkeeping and accounting operations, implementing some uh, accounting policies and procedures so that the financial reports are more accurate and can be used to assess the performance of the business. So, Excuse me, what did, what did you call it? Upcounting? Um, upgrade the accounting operations. Upgrade the upgrade the accounting. Got it. I'm writing these down and I feel as though I'm going to be clicking the link for this book right when we're done too. So, so yeah. that's for upgrading the accounting. What's five and six? So five is managing the business, right? We've set these objectives. We have to do the hard work of managing the business um, and reporting against the performance and understanding actual versus goal and what's causing the the variances and what can we do about it and have some kind of a management operating system to run the business. You know, EOS is very popular, but you know, there's Gazelles has its own system. So there's some kind of a framework to use to manage the business. You can use somebody's off the shelf framework or, or create your own, but there should be some kind of methodology to manage the business. To keep it going, to go forward, right? Yeah. yeah. To you know, Things- use the data. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Use the data to manage the business. And then the last step one. six is just this, uh, you know, learning and iterating and improving as we go. Right. Got it. After we spend a year really measuring the financial performance of the business against our financial objectives, we're going to learn a lot along the way. We're going to do a better job of setting the goals and the targets for the following year. We're going to do a better job of reporting and accounting. So we just kind of constantly, continuously improving and iterating and tweaking and learning from the data as we go. That's interesting. So keep it going. It's really simple, right? Six steps for success. At the end of the day, six things, implement them. Yeah, right. it's, it's, it's simple, but not easy, I guess you would say. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Simple, but not easy, right? So every business is unique. I'm sure no two businesses that you work with have all of the same traits, but where do you find the challenges in the six steps? I know all of them are challenging, but where do you find yourself spending most time with clients? Um, you know, when I'm engaged with a client, I like to try to focus on the most important financial metrics that really um, they really align with the owner's priorities, right? And so figuring out, like you have a scorecard with 25 metrics on it, but you can't manage 25 things. You can't even remember 25 things, right? So what are the top you know, five things that really matter that define the, the financial success and performance of the business? And then just staying focused on those five things um, and not losing sight of them. The discovery process getting there must be challenging the interview, the, the understanding of the human, right? Because that's ultimately what it is. How do, we, how do we model after the founder for what we really want this to become? Are, are we IPOing? Are we exiting? Are we creating jobs for our children? Are we simply found our way walking into an office every morning and not realizing how we actually got there? Right. And, you know, us entrepreneurs are a different breed. Like we want we want everything, right? We want high growth. We want high profitability. We want uh, not have to work too many hours. Um, you know, we want everything. And so we can't get everything. 
Um, one of the things that drives us is, you know, this innate desire to be successful and build things, but uh, we can't do everything. So, you know, prioritizing is, is often the challenge. That's interesting to prioritize and bring perspective to it, right? We're not going to get everything, but we're certainly going to try. We're certainly going to make every effort to, but what about the business owner? Not necessarily the, the entrepreneur, but the business owner. It's a different, a different mindset, right? So do you approach those clients differently? Um, you know, I think it, um, could you clarify the question, Mark? Um, so in my mind, a, a business owner and an entrepreneur have somewhat different characteristics, right? So business owner, you know, if you go to a rich dad, poor dad conversation, right? You're buying yourself, creating yourself a job. You're not, you're not working on the business as much. Do you find yourself with business owners and creating entrepreneurial mindsets around them? Or do you find that, you know, when you sit down with somebody, you're going to go wherever the leaf blows you? You know, we work with so many different kinds of businesses and so many different kinds of business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, you know, I think the ones that, um, you know, are super growth oriented are in that entrepreneur category. Um, where they're just by nature looking to build something and build it bigger and better and grow it. Right. And then the business owner, you know, may assess things a little bit differently where the business owner maybe has a clearer picture of what financial success looks like. They may not be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business as much. They can be a little bit detached um, in how they um, review and observe the performance of the business and they can, you know, set some clear financial targets based on the return on investment they're looking to get. Whereas the entrepreneur is just looking to build something and be creative and seize opportunities in the marketplace and, you know, see where it takes them. So which would the entrepreneur target of the six steps and embrace the fastest and the most easily and versus the small business owner? You know, I think the entrepreneur is, you know, always looking to learn and grow and, um, you know, identify ways to improve things. Um, so I think they're into the, you know, learning and iterating and improving and building things, um, but they may struggle to define a short, concrete list of financial goals because they're just going to go where the market, where they can take the market they want to go. Um, whereas the business owner may be more um, inclined to set clear goals and objectives and then measure against those um, but it isn't necessarily looking to capitalize on every opportunity in the marketplace because they just want to make a return on their investment. They don't care as much exactly how they make that return. Got it. So entrepreneurs, you're a member of EO Boston, correct? I am. Yes. How long have you been a member? Oh, geez. This is, I think my ninth year. I joined right after my kids were born. Um, and I was an accelerator when I was doing less than a million dollars a year in revenue. And then a couple of years later, I graduated into regular EO. So it's been a great, uh, it's been a great experience. Tell me why. Tell me about Accelerator a little bit. Why, why was that helpful? Uh, there's a lot of focus training and development for the accelerators because the chapter, you know, is investing in helping them grow their business. Um, so there's quarterly learning days and there's a lot of emphasis on growing the business, you know, to the point where it can scale past a million dollars and, you know, graduate from being an owner plus a couple helpers to being a business with a management team that can sustain itself, I guess is how I would put it. So the chapter really makes a big investment in, in helping the accelerators scale their business. How did you find your way there? Um, I had a business partner, I don't know, 25 years ago who um, joined EO when we started our first business when we were in our early 20s. Um, so he had been in EO and um, I was not, but um, my good friend, Glenn Grant, who I think you know. I do. Uh, he, uh, he encouraged me to check it out uh, back in 2011 or 2012. Um, and so I kind of re-engaged and uh, kind of realized what I'd been missing. So tell me about that. Tell me about where, where, where you're seeing the value. Um, 
you know, I really am one of those guys who loves to learn things and apply them to life, to business, to nutrition, to fitness. You know, I just like to learn new things and apply them to my life. Um, I like to build things. And so there's just such a tremendous opportunity to learn and grow within EO, between the learning events, between the conferences. Uh, you know, there's just no shortage of opportunities to learn and grow. It's, it's such a big spigot. You kind of eventually have to turn off parts of it because you can't keep up with everything. But, um, you know, depending on what you're looking to learn and develop, uh, you can usually find it within EO. And it's a great, um, great network of fellow business owners that you can call upon for support and help and experience. And folks that think the way you do. Yeah, I understand. Uh, that we understand each other. <laughs> Tell me about the owl behind you. I know folks that are consuming this audibly. There's a light blue and white, really cool looking owl behind Cal. What is that? So that's our mascot at SmartBooks. It's the wise owl. Um, uh, when we started the business, we didn't want to just kind of name it Wilder and Company. My wife and I started it, but uh, we wanted it to stand on its own. And so uh, we looked for a name and we looked for uh, some kind of a animal mascot uh, logo that would uh, somehow tie into the idea of getting good information from your financial reports. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Owl. So when did you start that company? 2009. Ooh, good timing. Yeah. Well, we started the first one in um, mid 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, I know both of them started in a, basically in the middle of a recession. That's interesting. Well, I mean, not to you know take away the evergreen nature of this conversation, but there's a lot of people feeling like 2009, at least in the real estate space in this late 2022, coming into 23 frozen, kind of looking around what's the next the next move. But, you know, funny story is you see, I think it was actually at Nerve um, in Virginia Beach. I saw one of the presenters put up a, a slide of all of the companies that started in 2008 and 2009. And they're, they, you know, you drive through growth is it doesn't matter what's going on around you. Right. That's the great thing about small businesses. You can kind of control your own destiny. I mean, obviously, in some industries, in some points in time, you can't, but in general, you know, small businesses can be nimble, they can adapt, they can thrive, even if the broad economy is not doing as well. What excites you about the future? Uh, I just want to work with more small businesses and help them get better control over their financial performance and start achieving more of their financial objectives using the financial information and reporting to help them run the business. That's what I really enjoy. What's there's always a story. Like there's a story. You look at the financial statements, they tell a story. Um, and so if you know how to read them, you can you can tell the story. It's the uh the international language, right? The numbers are the international language. I love the story because then you get to really dig in and understand understand your client, right? So what is keeping them up at night right now? Um you know, there's just so much uncertainty in the world with inflation probably being the biggest concern for many clients. It's the cost of everything um, is going up. Um, salaries of their employees, their raw materials, their rent. Um, you know, it, it's tough. We, we uh, people like, I'm 46 years old, so people around my generation really have not had to manage businesses through periods of high inflation. You'd have to go back to the early 80s when we last had sustained high inflation. And so it's it's new uh, it's new for a lot of people. Well, I would imagine other countries like like we've got, you know, whatever however you measure it, seven, eight, nine, ten percent inflation. But you know, I think about some other parts of the world where they have, you know, 50%, 100% right. inflation, not even how you would approach managing in that environment. We're having a tough enough time figuring out how to manage with our relatively high levels of inflation that are still lower than it could be. Right. They're lower than they could be. But I would imagine that your clients sleep a lot better understanding their numbers than before meeting someone like you, right? Because the uncertainty is certainly more uncertain when you have no idea what's going on with your numbers. Right, right. That's interesting. Well, we're, we've been learning 
learning f- from you, right? We've been learning from you. We want to learn who you are now. Tell me about, go back to Cal, you know, pre high school, maybe into high school. Where, where does, where does he realize that he's out there to help people? Well, I'd probably have to go to the end of my college days okay. uh, to figure out I might have had some entrepreneurialism in me because I was, you know, I grew up in a family where my father worked for the same company for his entire career. And then he retired from the company he went to work at for his first job out of school. Um, and in college, I was a hardcore pre-med biology major who got Whoa. into med school Um And so I was going down a traditional W-2 path um, until, you know, my last year in college, I'd done all this work, managed to get myself into med school, but this was the mid nineties. And at that time, the president was pushing to socialize medicine even more in this country. And I I questioned whether I really wanted to invest the next 10 years of my life to come out at, you know, 30 years old and take orders from the government and insurance companies. And so I think in hindsight, that may have really been the start of my entrepreneurial journey. I just didn't want to take orders from bureaucrats and uh, wanted to have a little more control over my destiny. And I ended up getting a job out of college at a very small business with four employees um, that was very entrepreneurial. So I think that would probably be the point in my life I would point to and say, all right, my, my career is going in a very different direction than I thought it was. You know, really forward thinking and futuristic on your part there, but that kind of makes me nervous, right? About how many intelligent scientists are going to say, I'd love to help you fix your body, but I'm going this way. You know, that's um, that's interesting because of the pressure you mentioned with the insurance companies and bureaucracies. That's That's a whole nother conversation, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's worked out well. I don't know. I'm always an optimist. I figure things happen for a reason and look at the bright side in life and don't worry too much about things that you didn't do. Well, that'll get that'll get you far. That'll keep you going. Tell me about that first job out of uh, out of Duke. Uh, so I was an equity analyst at a small hedge fund, basically researching um, companies and the valuation of their stocks and doing financial analysis to figure out which companies to invest in and which companies not to invest in. And uh, it was, it was uh, a tremendous experience. You know, I'm 22 years old and I'm getting on the phone talking to CFOs of public companies and researching and creating publishing reports. It was just a great experience. How were those conversations as a, as a young man? Do you have to jump oh. down and do set of push-ups and Pick up the phone and say, okay, <laughs> I'm calling this guy, this gal. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my boss just gave me a lot of responsibility and I enjoyed it. And it was, you know, it was probably the best first job out of college I could have had in hindsight. Um, I learned a lot, get a lot of responsibility. It's only four of us. So, you know. Nobody was getting paid to, you know, stuff envelopes. We had to do real work. Were you, uh, was it challenging to get them on the phone? And did you ever have uh, confrontational conversations with, with these leaders of companies? Um, You know, this was before um, the SEC started to restrict the ability of executives of the companies to talk to analysts. And so we had, you know, we didn't, we were in the small cap space. So we're talking to small public companies. So we didn't have a lot of trouble getting them on the phone. They were happy to talk to anybody who seemed like they might be interested in investing. And we had a research business. We're publishing research to institutional investors. And so uh, they were interested in making sure they got their story out. Cool. So then where did you go from there? Yeah. So then uh, after a couple of years there, I started my first business with two partners, uh, it's outsourced IT business. Um, so put up our own shingle at age 24, um, and went for it and, uh, you know, had a good ride there and were able to exit that company in a successful sale and, um, learning just a tremendous amount about how to run a business, (laughs) you know, Cool. Three so 24 year old, three 24 year old guys start this business and grow it, you know, 60 employees and eventually exit. So it was a, it was a, a tremendous learning experience. I met some great people. 
I met, I bet, I bet. Tell us, tell me and the listeners about some of those mentors that you met during that, geez, that impressionable time in your life. Yeah. Well, one of them was the CFO of a venture backed um, technology company in the communications hardware space. And uh, we went to meet with him. Um, he had a lot of zeros in his net worth. Um, yeah. I remember that. But, uh, you know, he said to me, look, you're the CFO. If your partner sells something and the customer doesn't pay, it's not your partner's fault. It's your fault because you're responsible for the finance of the business. Right. So this sense of, you know, you own the result, even if you're not personally, you know, doing something, you still have to own the result and be accountable for it and have systems and processes in place so that, you know, we're not selling things to people who don't pay. I love it. That's something that always stuck with me. So what'd you do after exit? You know, I worked for Staples, who was the buyer for about a year and a half. And, you know, we went from a 60 person company that was very dynamic and flexible um, to, you know, thousands and thousands of employees and um, very different environment. You mm-hmm. know, it was a good run, uh, but ultimately I was not going to be trying to climb the corporate ladder at a 10,000 employee company. So went back and uh, got back into the small business space. And we started SmartBooks shortly thereafter. Oh, okay. So right into SmartBooks. I love it. And you did that, you said, with your wife? Yeah, Jenny and I started the business together and Seagram business development for the first couple of years. And um, then we had had our twin boys and Nasa got our hands full uh, managing them in the house and everything going on there. And I'm uh, focused on the business. SmartBooks. I love it. So so when you're not hard charging, creating companies to exit, starting new companies, helping all sorts of other companies sleep at night. You're getting out there. You're, you're, you're doing endurance type stuff. I see you've been doing some halves and competitive, competitive uh, events. Yeah. I've done some five hour triathlons. Wow. Um, I was, you know, so many pounds, uh, many pounds ago, I was a little bit lighter in those years, but um you know, what I liked about it, you know, when you're training for a triathlon like that, some of the training is, you know, very long and you're kind of away from your desk. You might be on a bicycle for two hours, just you and the bike and the road. And you have a lot of time to think about the business and contemplate it, you know, like sitting down doing a spreadsheet, you just have time to think. Um, so get some great ideas, you know out on a bicycle for two hours or mowing the lawn for an hour or whatever, just time that's away, just you doing something um, away from your desk. Yeah. And then other kinds we're doing like super intense, high intensity intervals. And um, you're just struggling to get around that track as fast as you can. And you don't know, you can't even think about the business. It kind of forces you to unplug from the business because you can't focus on more than that intense training that you're doing. So I'm somebody that kind of can be compulsive about, always thinking about work. And so forcing myself to unplug uh, is sometimes healthy for me. That's really interesting. I've always been in awe with, with the whole Ironman concept, but I love how you bring into the, the training component of it, right? Because I'm sure there's similar goals that you have to attain to meet the matrix to get to the day of the event. Yeah. You'd map out your training plan for, you know, at least three or four months before the the target race and you might do some smaller races too, but there was always one big race for me a year that I tailor my plan around. I love it. And the, the, the idea of, of really disconnecting, right? So, I mean, I love what you're saying and, you know, you do the trail walks or you do things outside, but there's always like a pad of paper that you can jot a note down when you're on the bike and you're grinding on the track, if you're thinking about something, you are now required to recall it when you get back, as opposed to, you know, having that ability to be kind of plugged in, to be kind of taking notes, put it in the Evernote, put it somewhere to recall. And it may never recall for weeks, months, years, or it could the next day, right when you get in the car. Yep. Yep. Or if it's a breakthrough idea, you're just gonna be so excited to go uh, implement it later. I love it. I love, love, love that. If you could go back in time, back to the days, your senior year, contemplating medical school, going into business, what advice would you give yourself? Um, 
you know, I used to think that leadership was about, you know, having a charismatic personality or being really popular. Um, and that's not really me. Um, so I kind of was intimidated. Like I didn't, I had an opportunity to be the CEO of, of a business earlier in my career. And I didn't want that responsibility because I didn't think I was ready yet. Um, I think what I came to understand that leadership is really more about um, living to a consistent set of values and holding others accountable to those values. And you don't need to be a Jack Welch type personality to be a successful executive. You need to be clear with your values and consistent with those values and have the, the courage to hold other people accountable to them. Huh. I love that. I love that. You know, this has been great, Cal, and I really enjoyed talking with you. And I, I'm sure other people will, whether they're EO Boston members. So when you see Cal, say hello and let him know you heard this and that uh, you enjoyed his sharing. And then, of course, those those friends and clients and all who are hearing this, it's really been amazing to listen to you um, and, and learn from you. Where would someone connect with you if they wanted to uh, to connect with you? Probably the easiest way to get to me directly is through LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me, uh, Calvin Wilder, on LinkedIn. Um, and if you're interested in uh, a free consultation to understand how SmartBooks might be able to help your business, then you can go to SmartBooks.com and you know use the link there to sign up for a free consultation. SmartBooks.com. SmartBooks.com. What a great name. And then, of course, the financial operating system by Cal Wilder can be found where all fine books are purchased, even on Amazon. Yes. Uh, Amazon. Cal, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. This has been wonderful. I learned a bunch. I, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone did. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mark. It's been great. And it's awesome. You're taking time out of your busy schedule to host this podcast. And uh, I've enjoyed listening to other guests as well. So hopefully I've been able to deliver something of value. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And, and folks, thanks for listening. That is it. If everyone, anyone learned anything today or you laughed or, you know, you, uh, you, you, you sparked something in your mind, tell somebody about it. Share this podcast. Thanks again, Cal. Thank you, Mark. This has been another exciting episode of Leadership in Action. We will see you next time. Leadership in Action is sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs' Organization. As the world's only peer-to-peer -peer network exclusively for entrepreneurs, EO helps transform the lives of those who transform the world.